Welcome back to this series on meta-analysis. This lecture focuses on a statistic called the prediction interval. I'll be discussing a program that computes the prediction interval, and you can download that program at metaanalysisworkshops.com. When we report the results of a meta-analysis, we need to report the mean effect size and also how the effect size varies across studies. The variation in effect size is critically important when we consider the potential utility of an intervention. For example, consider a fictional meta-analysis of studies that assess the impact of a new vaccine. A risk ratio of one would indicate that the vaccine had no effect, and the further we move in this direction, the stronger the impact of the vaccine. Suppose that the mean risk ratio is 0.30 as indicated by this point. This tells us that the vaccine reduced the risk of infection by 70% on average. However, to understand the potential utility of the vaccine, we also need to know how the effect size varies across studies. Did the distribution of effects look like this, where the vaccine had pretty much the same effect in all populations? Or did it look like this, where the effects varied across this range? Or did it look like this, where the vaccine was very effective in some populations but had virtually no impact in others? What is clear is that we need this information. And therefore, virtually every meta-analysis tries to provide it. The problem is that in most cases, researchers report statistics that are intended to provide this information, but in fact do not. For example, some researchers believe that the confidence interval tells us how much the effect size varies, but in fact the confidence interval does not provide this information. Similarly, most researchers believe that the I-square statistic tells us how much the effect size varies, but while this belief is widespread, it is nevertheless incorrect. The I-square statistic does not provide this information either. In this lecture, I explain that neither of these statistics tells us how much the effect size varies across studies. And then I move on to the one statistic that actually does provide this information, which is the prediction interval. I explain what this interval means, I show how to use a computer program to quickly compute the prediction interval, and I also show how to use the prediction interval in considering the potential utility of a treatment. When we perform a meta-analysis to synthesize the results of many studies, we want to know two things. We want to know the mean effect size, and we also want to know how the effect size varies across studies. For example, Castells et al. performed a meta-analysis of studies that assessed the impact of methylphenidate on adults with ADHD, a syndrome that makes it difficult to concentrate. In each study, adults with ADHD were randomly assigned to either methylphenidate or placebo. At the end of the study, researchers assessed the patient's cognitive function. The effect size index is the standardized mean difference, D. To provide some context, a D value of 0.20 would represent a small effect with little clinical impact. A D value of 0.50 would represent a moderate effect. The patient would recognize that their cognitive function had improved, and coworkers might notice a change. Other treatments tend to have effects in this range. A D value of 0.80 would represent a large effect. An effect of this size would be exceptional. It turns out that the mean effect size is roughly 0.50. So on average, the drug increased cognitive function by a moderate amount. But to understand the potential utility of the drug, we also need to know how much the effect size varies across populations. For example, does the variation in effect look like this? While the effect size does vary, it always falls in the moderate range. So from a clinical perspective, we might say that the effect size is reasonably consistent across studies. Or does it look like this? 
There are some populations where the impact is marginal and others where it approaches an exceptional level. We might want to use the drug immediately for all patients since it is clinically useful in almost all cases, but still we probably would want to pursue research to understand what factors distinguishes these studies from these. Or does it look like this? There are some populations where the impact is trivial, some where it is moderate, and some where it is clearly exceptional. In this case, it should be a priority to understand what factors are associated with smaller effects or with larger effects. We probably would not want to use the drug in these cases, whereas we would obviously want to use it in these. And just to be clear, these three examples are simply three examples that I created for purposes of this illustration. Um, the actual distribution of effects could be more narrow than any of these or wider than any of these. So that's why we need to understand how the effects are distributed. It should be clear that we need this information. I'm going to show you that this information is generally not provided in a meta-analysis. And then I'm going to show you how you can present this information in a clear and concise manner. First, I want to make it clear that this information is generally not presented in the report of a meta-analysis. Most meta-analyses include a forest plot that displays the summary effect and its confidence interval as a diamond. This is a forest plot of the ADHD analysis, and the diamond is here. Some researchers assume that this diamond reflects the heterogeneity in effects, but this is incorrect. The width of the diamond corresponds to the confidence interval for the mean. It tells us that the mean effect size falls in this interval. While we can use a diamond to reflect the confidence interval, we can also use a point estimate bounded by a line, as I'm doing here. Again, this point corresponds to the mean effect size, and this line corresponds to the confidence interval. To this point, we've been looking at the forest plot. While the forest plot is useful for displaying the results of all the studies in the analysis, I'm going to use a different plot to display the dispersion in effects. The new plot looks like this. And the confidence interval that had been displayed on the forest plot, either as a diamond or as a line, is displayed here. The scale is different than it had been in the forest plot, but the values are the same and the meaning is the same. The confidence interval speaks to the precision of the mean. It says nothing about the dispersion of effects. Given that the mean falls in this interval, it's possible that the distribution of effects looks like this, or like this, or like this. Or it could look like something else entirely. The confidence interval tells us nothing about how the effects are distributed. Another common mistake is to think that the I-square index tells us how widely the effects vary. In fact, though, I-square does not provide this information. At the end of this video, I'll cite a number of papers to explain this point, including one paper by the person who co-created the I-square index. But for now, I can show you empirically that the I-square index does not tell us how much the effect size varies. I'll actually give you I-square. In this analysis, I-square is 47%. Based on that information, does the distribution of effects look like this, or like this, or like this, or like something else entirely? The answer is, we don't know. I-square does not tell us how much the effect size varies. So to recap, it should be clear that in order to have an informed discussion about the clinical implications of the heterogeneity, we need first to know what the heterogeneity actually looks like. We don't get that information from the confidence interval, and we don't get it from I-square. So where do we get it? For that, we need something called the prediction interval. If you're using the software Comprehensive Meta-Analysis version 4, the program will compute the prediction interval automatically. 
If you're using an earlier version of comprehensive meta-analysis or another program entirely, then you can use software that I've posted on our website. This software computes the prediction interval and will also plot the entire distribution of effects. This is how it works. I need to select the effect size index, and that would be the standardized difference in means. Then I go ahead and enter the data. The mean effect size is 0.506. The upper limit of the confidence interval is 0.650. Tor square, the variance of true effects is 0.039. And the number of studies is 17. Here we have the mean and the confidence interval. The mean is roughly 0.5 and the confidence interval is 0.35 to 0.65, which tells us that the mean effect falls someplace in this range. Then we turn to the distribution of effects. I can see that the impact of the drug is small in roughly 20% of populations, moderate in roughly 60%, and large in roughly 20%. Okay, to be clear, these judgments are subjective. Different people will have different opinions about what effect size should be considered small and what effect size should be considered moderate. That discussion is necessary and encouraged. The only point that I am making is that when clinicians sit down to have this discussion, they want to discuss how to proceed based on the fact that the distribution of effects looks like this. We don't want a situation where one thinks the distribution looks like this, and the second thinks that it looks like this, and a third thinks that it looks like this. When possible, it would be good to include this plot along with any presentation. You can actually click Export to PowerPoint or Export to Word. When it's not possible to include the plot, we can summarize the information in the plot by reporting the prediction interval, which is given here. This says the true effect size in 95% of all comparable populations falls in the interval 0.06 to 0.96. The reason this is called a prediction interval is this. Suppose that someone was planning to use this drug in a new population, which had been selected at random from the same pool as that employed for the analysis. She asks me what impact the drug will have in this new population, and I predict that the effect size will fall in the interval of 0.06 to 0.96. And when I do that, I'll be correct some 95% of the time. The interval is intended to capture the true effect size in 95% of all comparable populations some 2.5% will fall below this point, and another 2.5% will fall above this point. To this point, I've displayed the caption that reports the prediction interval. There's also a second caption that reports the confidence interval. The key point we need to understand is that each of these addresses an entirely separate issue. This line says the mean effect size is 0.51 with a 95% confidence interval of 0.36 to 0.65. The confidence interval is an index of precision. It tells us how precisely we have estimated the mean. The second line says the true effect size in 95% of all comparable populations falls in the interval of 0.06 to 0.96. That is the prediction interval. The prediction interval is an index of dispersion. It tells us how widely the effects vary. At one extreme, there are some populations where the effect falls here, and at the other, there are some populations where the effect falls here. One more point before we move on. This analysis was based on 17 studies. What would happen if the total number of studies was 1,000 rather than 17? Let's assume that the effect sizes in the new studies looked the same as those in the originals. Well, the confidence interval would look like this. The confidence interval tells us how precisely we've estimated the mean, 
And that depends on how many studies we include in our analysis. With a thousand studies, we would know the mean very precisely. By contrast, the prediction interval would look something like this. It would look pretty much the same as it did with 17 studies. And that's because the plot and the prediction interval tell us how much the effect size varies. And this has nothing to do with our analysis. The drug has a small effect in some populations and a large effect in other populations. That's how the drug works. And we cannot change that by increasing the number of studies in our analysis. Let me make a few more points before we move on. When we perform a random effects meta-analysis, we assume that there is some universe of populations that we care about. We define this universe as best we can using the inclusion-exclusion criteria, and then we locate all the studies that we can that fall within the universe. We then perform the analysis, and we use the analysis to make an inference to that universe. In our case, we can use the 17 studies in the analysis to make an inference to the universe of all comparable populations. When we say that the mean is 0.506, with a confidence interval of 0.36 to 0.65, we're not talking about the 17 populations in front of us. Rather, we're saying that in the universe of comparable populations, the mean probably falls in this interval. Similarly, when we say that the prediction interval is 0.06 to 0.96, or that the distribution of effects looks like this, we're not talking about the 17 populations in front of us. Rather, we're making an inference to the universe of all comparable populations. I also want to say one last thing about the distinction between the confidence interval and the prediction interval. These are two entirely different things. When researchers say that one is wider than the other, there is an implicit suggestion that these are two statistics that address the same point and that yield different estimates. That is not the case. To say that one is wider than the other is like saying that an egg is rounder than a computer. It is, but we would not think to make that comparison because we understand that an egg serves one function and a computer serves another. Similarly, the confidence interval provides information about the mean effect. The prediction interval provides information about the dispersion in effects. It makes no more sense to compare them than it would make sense to compare an egg and a computer. And using the confidence interval as an index of dispersion makes about as much sense as trying to send an email using an egg or eating a computer. I apologize to those of you for whom this is basic, but there are hundreds of papers in the literature that make this mistake and so I feel that this needs to be addressed at a very basic level. Let's look at a few more examples. This is a meta-analysis of studies that assessed the impact of Viagra on erectile dysfunction. This analysis was performed by Alexander Tsertsvardze et al. Uh, the analysis includes 19 studies where patients who were diagnosed with erectile dysfunction were randomly assigned to either Viagra or placebo. After a period of treatment, patients reported that they were or were not satisfied with the results. It turns out that the mean risk ratio is 2.50 with a 95% confidence interval of 2.27 to 2.75. This tells us that patients assigned to the drug were 250% as likely to report success as compared to those assigned to placebo. Again, the confidence interval tells us that the main effect falls in this interval, but this tells us nothing about the dispersion in effects. The distribution of effects could look like this, or like this, or like this. In this analysis, I-square was 51%. With that information, we still don't know if the distribution of effects looks like this, or like this, or like this, or 
like something else entirely. So to determine which of these actually corresponds to the data, I need to compute that. The effect size is a risk ratio. The mean risk ratio is 2.497. The upper limit of the confidence interval is 2.748. The value of Tor square is 0.022. When the effect size index is a risk ratio, Tor square is always reported in log units, and so we simply enter it in log units. The number of studies is 19. And the program creates this plot, which corresponds to the actual dispersion of effects. This happens to correspond to one of the hypothetical distributions I showed a moment ago, but the scale has changed. The captions at the bottom are generated by the program, and they summarize the plot. The mean effect size is 2.50, with a 95% confidence interval of 2.27 to 2.75. The mean effect size in the universe of comparable populations falls in this interval. Then we turn to the second caption, which gives us the prediction interval. The true effect size in 95% of all comparable populations falls in the interval 1.80 to 3.47. At one extreme, there are some populations where the risk ratio will be as low as 1.80, and at the other extreme, there are some populations where the effect size will be as high as 3.47. It seems to me that, from a clinical point of view, the drug is effective in all comparable populations. At the same time, the impact in some populations is substantially greater than in others, and it would make sense to see what moderators are associated with this. As I said in the earlier example, Clinicians will want to discuss what this dispersion means, but they should start the discussion with a common understanding of what the dispersion actually is, and that is what this plot provides. Let's do one more example using risk in one group. This is an analysis that looked at the risk of death from mitral valve surgery in patients more than 80 years of age. The analysis was performed by Fasto Biancari et al. They report that the mean risk of death is 17%, with a confidence interval of 14% to 19%. So we know that the mean risk falls in this interval. But what does the distribution of effects look like? Let me add that I square is 63.5%. With that information, does the distribution of effects look like this? Or does it look like this? Or does it look like this? Or like something else entirely? The only way to know is to actually compute the prediction interval. I open the program. I choose prevalence as the effect size index. The mean prevalence is 0.166. The upper limit of the confidence interval is 0.193. For the analysis of prevalence, or in this case incidence, there are several transformations that may be used. We assume that the logit transformation was used and this program should only be used if that was actually the case. The value of TOS square in logit units is 0 0.080. The number of studies is 25. And the distribution of effects looks like this. The program creates this plot, and this corresponds to one of the hypothetical distributions that I showed a moment ago. The captions at the bottom are generated by the program, and they summarize the plot. The mean effect size is 0.17, with a 95% confidence interval of 0.14 to 0.19. This line corresponds to the confidence interval, it tells us that the mean effect size in the universe of comparable populations falls in this interval. So much for the mean effect. We also want to know about the distribution of effects, and for that we turn to the prediction interval. And the true effect size in 95% of all comparable populations falls in the interval 0.10 to 0.27. 
So at one extreme, there are some populations where the risk will be as low as 10%, and at the other extreme, there are some populations where the risk will be as high as 27%. My interpretation would be that the risk of death is substantial in all these populations, but substantially higher in some than in others. If I needed to advise someone about the risk of having the surgery, it obviously matters if the risk is 10% or 27%. So this tells me that we need to understand when we can expect the risk to fall around here and when we can expect it to fall around here. In fact, this is what the researchers did in this analysis. But before they get to that, they want to understand how widely the risks vary. And that's what this plot tells us. It tells us that we're dealing with risks that fall over this range rather than one of the ranges that we saw a moment ago. I want to present one more example to make an important point. This is an analysis of studies that looked at the use of a second antipsychotic drug to augment clozapine in patients with refractory schizophrenia. The analysis was performed by Taylor et al. Patients in one group were given clozapine plus a second antipsychotic. Patients in the other group were given clozapine alone. The analysis looks like this. We're looking at the severity of symptoms, so a low score is good. A d-value to the left of zero favors the use of a second drug. A d-value to the right of zero tells us that the second drug might actually be harmful. The mean effect size is minus 0.24, with a 95% confidence interval of minus 0.45 to minus 0.03. Since the confidence interval excludes zero, the mean effect size is statistically significant. We reject the null hypothesis that the mean effect size is zero, and we conclude that the treatment is effective. Now let's have a look at the distribution of effects. I'll set the effect size index to D. The mean effect size is minus 0.239. The upper limit of the mean effect is minus 0.026. Tor squared is 0.062. And the number of studies is 15. So this is a plot of the effects. In this analysis, the result was statistically significant. Still, there are some populations where the treatment is harmful. When I teach classes in meta-analysis, there are typically several people who find this hard to understand. They assume that if the effect is statistically significant, the treatment must be effective in all populations. But as we see here, that is clearly not the case. Statistical significance tells us only that the mean effect size is helpful. This only means that the confidence interval excludes zero, as indicated by the fact that there's a gap between the confidence interval and the point of zero effect. It says nothing about the effect size in any single population. That said, the people who raise this question are simply being logical. To rephrase their question, if an effect can be statistically significant, but still harmful in some cases, why should we declare that a treatment works based on statistical significance alone? shouldn't we also look at the dispersion and effects? Of course, the answer is yes, and that is why we should always report the prediction interval. There are three last points that I want to make in closing. First, if you actually want to learn about any of the treatments I used in my examples, uh, please go back and read the original paper. Uh, don't rely on this video. Second, Estimates of heterogeneity are only reliable when the analysis includes a reasonable number of studies. The minimum number of studies that you would need to obtain a useful estimate of heterogeneity will depend on a number of factors, but 10 studies could serve as a useful minimum. I would only expect the prediction interval to be useful if the analysis included 10 studies or more. However, don't think that this is a reason to use I-square or some other index. The need for 10 studies applies to I-square 
it applies to tau square, and it applies to all other statistics that address some aspect of heterogeneity. The last point is this. I said several times that I-squared does not tell us how much the effect size varies. And you may be wondering what it does tell us. I don't go into that here because I find it's better to address one issue at a time. There is another module in our workshop dedicated entirely to I-squared. For more information about the workshop, please visit our website, metaanalysisworkshops.com. I also address this issue in a number of other places and these also provide the formulas for computing the prediction interval. The first of these is a paper called Basics of Meta-Analysis. I-squared is not an absolute measure of heterogeneity. This was published in Research Synthesis Methods, and this is a paper that I co-wrote with Larry Hedges, Julian Higgins, and Hannah Rothstein. Julian Higgins is the person who co-created the I-squared index along with his colleague Simon Thompson. I mention this to make it clear that Julian agrees with the points that I've made here. I-square was never intended to tell us how much the effect size varies. Another paper is this one, which was published in the Journal of Physiotherapy, and the paper is called Research Note. In a meta-analysis, the I-square index does not tell us how much the effect size varies across studies. I also discuss this at length in my book, Common Mistakes in Meta-Analysis and How to Avoid Them. On the book's website, you can download the section on heterogeneity, where this is covered in detail, and the PDF is free. I would also recommend this paper by Joanna Inthout et al. The paper is titled, A Plea for Routinely Presenting Prediction Intervals in Meta-Analysis. These issues are discussed in our text, Introduction to Meta-Analysis by Michael Borenstein, Larry Hedges, Julian Higgins, and Hannah Rothstein. These issues are addressed in both editions, but are covered in much more detail in the second edition, which is scheduled for release in late 2020. And you might also want to have a look at our workshops and our software. Sign up on this website and we'll send you information from time to time. This is also where you can download the Prediction Intervals program. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. This is Michael Borenstein and my email is michael at metaanalysis.com. Uh, thank you.